Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of AI. Is it the end of organized radiology, or is it? Now, we spoke about PEs. That was the last thing we spoke about, how valuable it was. This article uh, is a good article by TOEF, which shows the value of AI. To evaluate the efficacy of AI in detecting incidental PEs and shorten the time to diagnosis. And so again, this is one of the things that AI is very good at. You're going to read all the cases. Remember, articles have been published how uh, in a busy ER with brain CT, you want to look and see who is a bleed. And so you have AI just simply detect the presence of blood and move it to the top of the priority list. The same thing here, AI-assisted workflow prioritization of incidental pulmonary emboli on routine CT and oncology patients shortens the time to diagnosis. Now, this article also made the point that many places, not ours as being one of them, patients with a lot of the oncology studies may not be read for a day or so because they're not really considered emergency studies and they're backed up and they just read them eventually. And then you may not make a diagnosis of a PE for 24 to 48 hours. This way, every study has the PE software looking and if a PE is detected, then the study will be read that moment of that day. So a very good article. Some of the key points, AI software for detecting incidental PEs at chest CT in patients with cancer had a very high sensitivity and specificity and 99.9% .9 negative predictive value. In a practice with a backlog of unreported exams, AI-based work list prioritization reduced the median detection of incidental PEs from several days to an hour. And the miss rate of incidental PEs was reduced from 44.8% to 2% when radiologists were assisted by the AI tool. Wow, these are impressive results in radiology. Again, it makes the point, how could you not be using AI in clinical practice? Now, when we turn to mammography, Regina Barzillet is an AI person from uh, Mass General and MIT. And she has done a lot of work looking at transforming how we read mammography. In this article by McKinney, The Evaluation of AI for Breast Cancer Screening, it was able to show that AI was greater than the average radiologist by an absolute margin of 11.5%. They also ran a simulation in which AI participated in a double reading process that is used in England and found that AI maintained a non-inferior performance and reduced the workload of the second reader by 88%. Now in England and a few other European countries, you always have two readers. Now I will tell you that AI has done so well that they're now allowing the second reader to be AI and not another radiologist. And in this world where radiologists are in short supply, this becomes very important. Now. In this PERFORM study on mammography, comparing the performance of human readers and a commercially AI available algorithm, and again, you can see that PERFORM's test set, 60 challenging cases, and they looked at comparing the radiologist and AI. What was the conclusion? The diagnostic performance of AI was comparable with that of the average human reader when evaluating cases from the two test sets. Now, all you have to be is as good as the radiologist to be valuable. If you're better, it even makes it better. And diagnostic performance of AI was compatible to the average human reader in this one study. But this is with one software package. There are other software packages and other articles where AI is in fact better. In this article by Chen, Diagnostic Performance of a Commercial Available AI System, was comparable with that of human readers. Again, that same article, but again, um, the use of external quality assessment schemes may provide a model for regularly assessing the performance of AI. So again, AI needs to be compared to human readers so our patients also have confidence in what we're doing. And here's the point I made about double reading in this article by Phil Potts. The AI system evaluated by Chen could be used as a supplemental tool to aid the performance of readers in the U.S. and other countries that only use a single reader. 
Forget the fact that in Europe, they're now using AI as the second reader instead of a radiologist. In the U.S., there's only one reader. Now you can give someone for the same price, basically, two readers. Isn't that fantastic? Now, there's an article which I like by Drash, talks about automation bias, which is the propensity for humans to favor suggestions from automated decision-making systems. And it is one of the problems with AI. You know, if AI is so good and you disagree with AI, perhaps you're going to say, you know, that AI is 98% accurate. I'm not that good. Maybe I'll listen to AI. This article looked at experienced, moderately experienced, and very experienced radiologists reading mammograms. And they found out that, no great surprise, the less experience you had, the more likely you were to believe the AI when you disagreed. But it also showed that even the best radiologists would change their mind to what AI said. But again, inexperienced radiologists. So it raises the question, for example, you know, will AI kind of become the only reader where the radiologist is putting their name down, perhaps, but they're believing everything AI said? It's also very important, I think, and I'm not going to go into this, in training residents. If you have AI in place, will the resident simply believe what the AI says because it's so good and not really learn how to read a PE study or read a mammogram because the AI is so good? So it is a real question. Now, I showed you a couple apps where AI is there. What's coming soon? Just by the literature, liver tumor detection and analysis, skeletal trauma, osteoporosis detection, which has been around for a bit and is even one of the things that's paid for at the lumbar spine, adrenal mass analysis, renal mass analysis, and coronary artery analysis from calcification to stenosis. Uh, in this article by Naki, looking at the liver, AI pirate software detected more than half of liver mets overlooked by radiologists while maintaining a relatively low number of false positives. So their results suggest the potential for AI in reducing the frequency of liver mets that are missed. So the liver becomes important. In this article by Gosme, uh, fractures were missed by pediatric radiologists, yet picked up by AI. The algorithm showed superiority in terms of sensitivity over emergency physicians, which suggests a real-life benefit. Again, one of the things also when you talk about AI and comparing it's who you're comparing to, but then you have to be practical. You could say that the radiologist is as good or better than the AI in picking up fractures, but if there's no radiologist and the images are looked at for 24 hours, perhaps, by the ER doc or the orthopedic surgeon, if AI is better than the orthopedic surgeon, yes, in the long term, they may not help. But in the short term, when the patients are in the ER, it's particularly valuable. So you have to be practical in comparing things. Now, if I asked, what's the barriers with AI? It's always practical things. Reimbursement, okay, who should pay for this? Is it radiology or is it the hospital? What about physician reliance on AI? More the over-reliance. Potential issues with bias and AI algorithms. Is it the wrong population? Was your population uh, evaluated? If you're looking at African-American patients and the algorithm was based on Caucasian patients, will it work as well? What about liability? Liability is always an issue. And what about our patients? Will they feel comfortable with AI? Now, perhaps maybe not AI alone, but AI with clinicians, will they be comfortable? And the black box nature of AI that we showed you as we looked at cystic pancreatic lesions, we use this EGM, the glass box work from Microsoft, where you can understand precisely how all decisions are made. So who will get paid for AI in medicine? Again, will you get paid? If you can read faster and more accurate, your insurance company may say, I'm not paying you. It's part of the course of doing the study. Since you can read faster, uh, either I reduce the, the payments or we keep the payments as they are, but we're not going to pay you more. That's always going to be a question. What do you do in the face of minimal to no reimbursement now? A lot of people aren't buying AI because it's not profitable. But the question is, is it good for the patient? And is AI the responsibility of the hospital or the health system? Is it no different than PACs? Who's paying for this? What about the infrastructure? Who's taking care of that? What about our patients? Is AI a dream come true or is it a nightmare? 
How do we work this out with our patients? What do we tell them and what we do, what do we do? Well, the reality is if you're a patient, we're all patients, we all have family members. I wanna make sure I have the best diagnosis. If you tell me AI is gonna help reach the best diagnosis, I'm all in. Just because it's a radiologist or a surgeon or pathologist, whatever it is, I want the best diagnosis. I don't want a 40% error rate. What are the legal barriers in AI for clinical practice? Who's responsible for the accuracy of an AI system when it's an error? Now you make an error, it's the radiologist. If the radiologist uses AI but signs off and gets paid, it's still the radiologist. What about the liability of the health system? Did you buy the right AI system? Are you going to sue NVIDIA or Google or Microsoft? You know, lawyers want to sue everybody. This article by Jonathan Meserick made the point, legal liability for errors committed by AI will influence AI's ultimate role within radiology and whether AI remains a simple decision support tool or develops into an autonomous member of the healthcare team. Again, if it's autonomous, that means you're gonna sue the developer of the algorithm or the buyer of the algorithm. If it's just a support, then it's still the radiologist who's responsible. That makes it a lot easier. A radiologist breaches the standard of duty when the expected standard of care is not met. The standard of care is the degree that a reasonable, prudent radiologist would be expected to read a study. But how do you change that when you have AI? That's going to be very interesting. And that's something that is being worked out. Again, AI programs may not be valid. Not everything works as advertised. I think it's important that if you read an article that says AI is good for detecting bleeds, which showed 97, 98% accuracy, it was then done on UCSF patients, all comers. So now every CT scan that was done, it was only 50% accurate. The users still felt it was helpful, but it didn't have the accuracy that was advertised. And again, it was it done on one scanner, a specific scanner, one patient type, what can you do? There was an issue with sepsis prediction. Very, very good articles written about sepsis prediction with AI. And then one of the companies developed their own system. Epic developed their own system, which was about 7% accurate. It picked up only 7% of 2552 patients with sepsis. So just because you have a program doesn't mean it's as accurate as the next program. You can't be buying the cheapest thing in town or from a certain vendor you like, because all things for PE may not be created equal. The sepsis is a very, very good example. Will AI preserve or eliminate your job? Okay, right now there was an article in the paper this week that said for every resident finishing this three jobs. Okay, so we're in good shape now. But I will tell you, things may change. If AI is good and you could read more, it may bring things more into balance. But surely the radiologist who doesn't use AI will be eliminated. And this idea, and this is an article by Philip Soyer and us, and it supports the idea of AI augmented radiologists, okay? As the applications of AI increase, it becomes clear that the role of radiologists may change dramatically in the coming years, raising addition, additional issues in terms of responsibility and liability. And so we need to be careful and we need to pay attention because things can become unpredictable and nothing AI included is gonna be 100% accurate. So how do we do better? How do we control things? And that becomes especially problematic as AI gets better. There are articles that show for looking at plain x-rays, uh, when they're negative, AI is 100% accurate. That was deep mind from Google. Does that mean if it segregates normal from abnormal and only the abnormals are read by the radiologist? But what if it made a mistake and called something normal when it wasn't? Where's the responsibility in that scenario? And again, predicting the future is really hard. We stated that in the short term, radiologists should focus on maximizing their relevancy by improving their visibility and value to referring clinicians and contributed to meaningful cutting edge research with new and evolving modalities. In the long term, we'll have to wait and see what happens, but the way to predict what's gonna be, the, the way you wanna be involved, if you're involved now, you probably will be involved later. 
the road ahead is going to be interesting. And again, this article by Matthew Lundgren, New England Journal of Medicine. Matt is a radiologist, actually. He still works part-time talking about how AI practices will change. The majority of radiologists and residents expect substantial changes in radiology within the next decade and believe that AI should have the role as a co-pilot. Remember, Microsoft is doing co-pilot. Matt is with Microsoft and Nuance and is leading the charge in technology and in development and in things like ChatGPT. So it's exciting the work they're doing. Again, the ability of combining radiologists and non-radiologists. For instance, one study showed that AI system for chest radiograph interpretation, when combined with input from a non-radiology resident, had performance values that were similar to those of board-certified radiologists. One question that's going to come up is, why does radiologists get paid to read the scans? If you have an internist or a pulmonologist or an orthopedic surgeon who uses AI and their accuracy is the same as radiologists, when you put the two together, will radiology still maintain its monopoly over reading? That's going to be something that probably is of more concern to the radiologists in terms of the future. And this article by Raj Purkar and Lundgren is a spectacular article well worth reading. In this article by Fitzgerald, the introduction of AI algorithms might do is provide that data management and safety regulations are in place, is reduce the cost and time to diagnosis. That would be spectacular. AI can be a training tool that provides immediate specialist feedback to generalists so that in time they may perform at an expert level. If we make everybody into an expert, the patients will really benefit. This article by Wang and Drazen, New England Journal of Medicine, it's important to understand that in this fast-moving field, so to some extent what we see and what we publish may have the resolution of a snapshot of a landscape taken from a bullet train. Very, very good article. It makes the point things are rapidly changing. You've got to be paying attention, but what's true today may change by tomorrow. So is artificial intelligence the end of organized radiology? I think it's the end of radiology as we know it. But you know, we've done this before. CT came along, that changed all of radiology. MR came along, it changed all of radiology. PET scans, PMSA changed all of radiology and AI is going to change everything we do. I think it's exciting. I think you need to be part of it. You need to be paying attention. And the future, to quote Devo, is so bright, I think we need to wear shades. And with that, have a great day, everybody. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.